Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Poet Respond Live, our Sunday morning news show exploring current events through the lens of poetry. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and if you love poetry as much as we do, and I know you do, please click the like button right now, or uh, share, or uh, whatever you can do to um, tell the tech overlords that you like poetry and it's something meaningful that should be spread around the internet, because that's what we want to do here. Now, Poetry Respond Live, as you know, is mostly an open mic show, and let me tell you how to do that first, if you'd like to participate. Um, all you have to do is send your poem to openmic at rattle.com if you haven't submitted it. If you have it, I'll just have it for um, through the submission, non-submittable. But if you've made revisions or um, didn't submit it, you can email it to openmic at rattle.com right now, openmic at rattle.com, and I will uh, be able to pull it up and uh, let people read along as you read, which is always nice. Um, and then what you do is either call me at 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Let it ring a few times and hang up, and I will call you back uh, at some point during the hour. Um, or you, even better, you can send me a chat message over Skype to Rattle Poetry, all one word, and I will call you uh, over Skype when the time is right, and that way we can see it too in this little black box right here. Uh, okay, so today's poet... Um, is this, you know, it, it was a week of um, a lot of news, you know, uh, the last few weeks where the holiday slowness, we kind of talked about having short shows uh, because, you know, for the first time in a year, we had o under 100 submissions at one point. But this week, we're back up to about almost 300 submissions. And um, the poem I chose, I just love this poem by Beth Williams. But let's let's call up Beth Williams and see if we can connect with uh, Beth. Um. The poem was, I knew better than to say. Hey, Beth, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you yet. Hey. Here you come. I think your video is coming in. There you go. Okay. Hello. So how are you doing? Doing okay. Yeah. Crazy times, but doing okay. They definitely are crazy times. Um so, so tell me a little bit about, about um, your poem and how it came to be. Well, um, it started because I noticed so many of my friends were asking me to write about what happened on Wednesday with the Capitol. And mm -hmm. I just didn't want to give it any more airtime. I didn't even want to acknowledge that it was happening. I wanted it to go away. And then, you know, I write about everything that bothers me. <laughs> Obviously, I was bothered by it and had to write about it anyway. So... Yeah, and it has one of those things that, um, I don't know, do you find it frustrating where people want you to write about everything? Like, you, um, you know, like, the thing I hate hearing the most is, that's a poem, you know? Any friend who um, you tell any story to, they're like, that's a poem, you know? And um, does that, or, or do you um, do you think that, that, that everything is a poem, you know? <laughs> well, I do think everything is. And I have a lot of friends, when they say something, they're like, oh, no, you're going to put that in your poem. <laughs> it's true. It does show up sometimes. Um, yeah. So, um, I don't know, where are you calling from, too? I didn't write it. I didn't uh, write it down yet. I'm in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia. So that's not too far away from the capital, right? It's about three hours if mm -hmm. there's not traffic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's hear this poem. I knew better than to say. Okay. You want me to go ahead and read it? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead and read it. Okay. I knew better than to say. Friends want me to write about it, explain how a match turns to fire, as if I'm the only one who knows how to research insurrection. But I'd rather write about the bird flying south with her, win with her dinner dangling like a little war flag from her mouth, how she waits with a trait unknown to me until she's secure on a limb to eat. I'd like to write about fears over my shoulder, the fact that love will one day leave me empty, like an egret standing one-legged on a pier, looking into the river for food. This day, nothing swims by. Yes, I'm afraid of being left alone, afraid I might be the pelican left behind, my flight so pitiful I'm not even able to follow the down of the nearest draft. I cannot turn my head all the way around. 
If I could see behind me, I might stop right here and wait. I might run my fingers through his hair just before sleep takes my lover away, breathing deeply in all he exhales. Don't ask me again to write that this is not who we are. It is. We are the species unable to fly, the unwinged walkers who every single day find a way to pluck the idea of hope from the sky. And once a year, we make an excuse for all we have done by saying Happy New Year. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Beth. I, I just love the, the twists and turns the poem takes as you go through uh, really wonderfully crafted piece of writing. Um, and and I, what I love, too, about the ending is um, just the way, you know, events like, like what happened on Wednesday um, always remind me that, that we're just sort of animals, you know, like like just the, the lack of, um, you know, rationality and just the, the chaos of the world is, is, is what was most striking to me, you know, thinking about that. Um, is, can you say a little bit about just what, what was your reaction to, or, and what did you do? Did you watch... Uh, what was going on live? Were you glued to the news like a lot of people? Unfortunately, I couldn't turn it off. Yeah. Um, yeah, my husband's working at home right now and had the television on and called me in. And that was the end of the day. I just couldn't I couldn't leave it because I just couldn't believe it. And, and sort of like what the poem says, I'd much rather just be looking out at a bird and observing something that has nothing to do with what humans really are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, well, thanks so much for joining us. And that was Beth Williams. Uh, wonderful poem. I just love that. And I know a lot of, a lot of people did too already with the comments I, I've gotten on it. Thanks so much for sharing that, Beth. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Okay, bye. Yeah, and that was today's uh, poet Beth Williams with uh, I Knew Better Than to Say. Uh, let me... Let's go to a blast from the past, which is actually kind of interesting. Um... Uh, what what we uh, what happened four years ago today on Poets Respond? Um, I'm not sure exactly which day this was, um, where the event actually happened, but um, four years ago, January 10th, 2016. Let's look at this. This is um, oops, this is um, this refuge from its very inception has been a tool of tyranny, and that's a quote by. I'm Ammon Bundy, leader of the armed seizure of the Malhur National Wildlife Refuge. If you don't remember this, um, in 2016, the, the Bundys took over that wildlife refuge, and there was a standoff with federal agents and, and whatnot. And Pepper Trail is a, um, um, a biologist who had worked there at some point. And um, let, me, let me read his note before I read the poem, because it'll tell the story a little bit. The Malhur, I don't know if I'm saying that right. The Malhur National Wildlife Refuge was established by President Theodore Roosevelt over 100 years ago to protect an extraordinary landscape of marshes and sagebrush steppe in the high desert of eastern Oregon. The refuge is a paradise for birds and other wildlife, and naturalists travel to Malhur from around the country to experience its abundance. I have spent many unforgettable days there. This week, the refuge headquarters was occupied by armed anti-government extremists who declared their intention to remain for years. Their demands remain unclear, but their attitude toward the preservation of America's public lands for the benefit of wildlife is well summarized in the quote from their leader that is the title of this poem. And let's, uh, let's give a listen to this. This is, uh, hopefully it'll be loud enough. If not, I'll read it myself. But once again, this is, This refuge from its very inception has been a tool of tyranny by Pepper Trail. This refuge from its very inception has been a tool of tyranny. Emin Bundy, leader of the armed seizure of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge headquarters. The tyranny of cranes stalking the marsh edge, their rust-red colts gangling behind. The tyranny of warblers, feathers flashing through the leaves in early spring. The tyranny of pronghorn, trying their speed across the unfenced plain. The tyranny of sage-grouse, their ancient dance of boom and strut. The tyranny of winter geese, their numbers doubling the blizzard. The tyranny of solitude, the playa echoing the silent moon. The tyranny of butterflies gliding above the rabbit brush. The tyranny of desert trout, sheltering in willow shade. The tyranny of water, 
free of pump and ditch, the tyranny of land, free of sheep and cow, the tyranny of refuge. And once again, that was Pepper Trail with uh, a poem from four years ago. This refuge from its very inception has been a tool of tyranny. Um, it's an interesting look back at the past. Now, uh, let's see what you have for us all today. Um, and once again, I'll show you what um, um, what the options are. So uh, send your poem to openmic at rattle.com if you haven't yet. Then I can show it online, or I can pull it up from Submittable if you, if you submitted it um, you know, earlier this week. And then give me a call at 818-850-7727 or send me a chat message over Skype at Rattle Poetry. We have a big lineup of uh, people this week, which I kind of expected because, like I said, we had um, a lot of poems, um, you know, up to 300, which is not the um, thousand that we had some weeks in the early uh, pandemic. But uh, but it's a lot. And um, and, and mostly was about um, what happened Wednesday. And so we published two. um, We have another poem coming up by uh, Cliff Mason. A, a sonnet, insurrection sonnet, on Tuesday. He couldn't be here today. He had um, other, uh, you know, he had other things to do. But um, looking forward to hearing that on Tuesday. If you you follow Rattle, of course, or subscribe to our daily email and all that stuff, or follow us on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Let's call up. Um, let's see, who should we call up first? Let's call up um, Ezekiel Stevens. Ezekiel has a poem called Gallows Humor. And we'll we'll check that out. I'll pull it up while well, the phone's ringing. Hey, hey, Ezekiel. Um, I can hear you and see you. Let's uh, let's pull you into the broadcast. So, um, so how are you doing right. today? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm good. And and where are you calling from? I'm calling from Senegal, West Africa. Oh wow, Senegal, West Africa. That's awesome. Um, and, and what do you have for us? What what kind of uh, what do you write about? Uh, this is about the insurrection, the Trump supporters storming the Capitol building. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, I'm sure many many submissions were about that, uh, and. I th- thought, well, when I heard the, this news, I actually laughed. I thought that's kind of an interesting response. I should write about that. <laughs> and uh, the more I think about it, like looking back, it's probably inspired by John Donne's uh, Death Be Not Proud and the emotions in that poem. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think poetry is a big part of it, is expressing ideas in new ways, in new and interesting uh, ways. And that's usually done with the vocabulary, with the but I wanted to do that with the emotions in this one uh, because I figured a lot of these would be like kind of sad and depressing. And so I wanted to bring a different emotion to the table. Yeah, well, uh, definitely there's an element of humor, too, as for as serious as events were with a guy with the horns. And, you know, and I mean, I don't know that the, the absurdity at some level was uh, was definitely there's an element there. Yeah. So I'm glad you pulled that out. Let's hear it. This is um, Gallo's humor. I'll put it up on screen for everybody at home. Gallows humor. Some people cried when they heard of the insurrection, but I just laughed. Hey, Trump, you funny guy, with your troop of clowns playing king of the hill. Think America is as fragile as your lies, your shallow threats, shouted words, boots to doors. Do you really think democracy can be killed with gunshots? This isn't Rome and you aren't Caesar. You're smarter than to be complicit in your pyromania. Here you must earn your respect. It's not inherited, you jester fool. Oh, I've had a lot of fun watching you up there on that pedestal stage with your sleight-of-hand tweets. What a sensation, you White House magician. But now your act is just about over, and I'm getting tired of laughing. It's time to end this circus. America, see you to the door. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. And once again, that was um, uh, Ezekiel Stevens calling from Senegal. Thanks so much, Ezekiel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have a good day. Okay. Let's call up um um let's call up uh Richard Westheimer. See what Richard has for us today. 
So the phone's ringing now for Richard. Hey, Tim Green. Hey, Richard. How are you doing today? <laughs> Good. Um, I'm just in a long lineup of people who couldn't look away from Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, it was quite the spectacle. It really was. Um, um, is there anything you want to have to say about it? Well, uh, of course, probably like many other poets, I tried not to write about this. Mm -hmm. And then and then I wrote about it in a way that was um, um, like on the nose, you know, just sort of like expository. Mm -hmm. um, but I, an image that couldn't, I couldn't escape from uh, was, I, I don't have a television, so I was watching on my, my laptop uh, some things as they came down. And CNN had a long view of the face of the Capitol. And you could see flying in between the camera and the Capitol seagulls just all day. And and this is sort of captured a little bit in the poem that uh, that you published, which is, you know, f for the rest of the world, not including humans, life goes mm -hmm. on, yeah, you know, just dis yeah. despite this. Um, so I just let that image unfold and see where it went and then tried to ex excise as much exposition as I could. I couldn't do it completely mm -hmm. because there's just so much that, of course, is in our brains. So that that's sort of the... And then it sort of unfolded a little sonnet-like. Uh, I don't know if you... Uh, this is one I submitted to you, so you probably yeah, have Yeah, What there. Lies Beneath. Um, and um, I just thought, how few words could I express what was mm -hmm. what was going on? I couldn't do it in a haiku. <laughs> yeah, a, yeah, definitely not. Okay, let's hear it whenever you're ready. Okay. What lies beneath? At first, <clears throat> I thought there were doves sweeping the skies between the camera's eye and the horde scaling the walls of the Capitol. No, they were gulls flashing white, eaters of dead flesh. They sought the bodies of shrews and voles. They found the decaying carrion of a nation. A storm gathers, warriors assemble, rats perch on their tense necks, gnaw them raw and whine white grievance in their ears. The men with jaws unhinged shriek grimy winds from the depths. The women bare their breasts, how chthonic curses. Oh, the undoings just become begun. We possessed this place, America. Now it possesses us. Excellent. Great poem. What Lies Beneath by Richard Westheimer. Thanks so much for sharing that and be on the show again, Richard. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Okay, that was Richard Westheimer with What Lies Beneath. Um, let's call up now... Um, Let's call up uh, Mania Lenat. We'll see the the ringer's off, so I'm not sure if. Uh, it, oh, here we go. Hey, this is Tim with Rattle. Can you hear me? We're coming in. Let's see. We're connected, but I can't hear or see. Oh, here we come. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, and uh, oops. And Thanks. Where are you uh, calling from? Uh, I'm from uh, Romania, uh -huh. Europe. And I'm Great. a little writer from. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you could join <clears throat> us. Um, and, and what do you have for us? What do you want to share? Uh, I want to read a little poem that I uh, sent to you. Uh, his name is, uh, I hope that uh, God exists. Yeah, let me pull it up for everybody. I hope that God exists. I have it right here. Is there anything you want to say uh, to introduce it? What was it about? Uh, I love very much poetry. It's uh, poetry from, uh, for me, it's like uh, a mm -hmm. therapy. And that, uh, it's all I want to say. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, okay. okay. Well, go, let's go ahead and hear it. I hope that God exists in my bedroom with my ex-wife in ours, like a rabbit with blue eyes. I hope that God exists at the edge of the life, behind the station, 
were teenagers smoking the last sunny day. I hope that God exists in my garage when it's cold to change my car, to change my dreams. I hope that God exists and it's a wind blunt with long legs. Submissive and sad. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. It was Manea uh, Lanat. Am I saying that right? Manea Yunus. Yeah, okay. great. Thanks so much for uh, for sharing it and uh, for calling thanks. in. I appreciate it. Yep, goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, so that was, um, let's see. That was in response to the lack of faith these days. Yes. Um, okay, let us go on to the next caller, and that will be, uh, let's see, we'll do Jill Spielman next, but we'll do um, Patricia Rockwood right now. So the phone's ringing for Patricia. I'll find Patricia's poem. Hi, Tim. Hey, Patricia. Um, I can't see if you want to be on vi audio or video. Am I? Uh... I need to turn my video on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How's that? Um, still not seeing you, but but up oh, there you come. Okay. And my, my screen is all messed up today. I'm trying to fix it for everybody, but it's, I don't know, I, I must have changed the setting somewhere. I didn't realize it. There's a bunch of black boxes everywhere today. But um, let, me, let me see what you have. Um, Patricia Rockwood. The one I just sent you, it's called January 6th. Ah, I see today, January 6th, yeah. Okay, let me, uh, let me just put this in a Word doc really quick so I don't uh, give out your email address. Um, and so what was it about? January 6th, I assume that that was um, that was the Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to say about it before you read? Um, no, just that um, after Beth Williams poem, I, I just felt like I could never write anything again. Hers was so beautiful. Well, so, don't, but, well, but don't I feel that way. That, you know, every, <laughs> I don't know. Everybody's got their own poems. Um, yeah. So let's hear let's hear what you had. OK. January 6th. The next day, we ask ourselves if we can ever be ourselves again, like when a door slams and the birds stop singing for a moment, rigid on the branch, alert to danger, and the squirrel stops rustling in the leaves, sitting up, tail twitching, watching for hawk or cat. Then after a time, the birds go back to chirping to each other in the tree, and the squirrel digs in the leaves again, but we are not so lucky. We will remember the sound of a door slamming on our innocence, and the scar of that day will stay with us for the rest of our lives. Excellent. That was January 6th by Patricia Rockwood. It's really fascinating. I, you know, I noticed this as I was reading submissions yesterday, and then the two that we accepted for publication, both, the two both turned to nature. There's so much sort of thinking about the natural world versus sort of the insanity of, uh, of our human world, I think is the, the theme for today. Um, oops, Patricia dropped. I was going to ask her something, but that's okay. Um, let us go to the next caller. Let's do uh, Navadita. Let's see what Nivi has for us this morning or this evening for her. Hello. Hey, Navadita, how are you doing today? Um, I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. Let me get you in the screen there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, what do you have for us today? You have a, an article. I've already clicked on it because I'm assuming there's going to be something fun to look at. Um, <laughs> so, so what did you write about today? It's, um, again, animal-themed, but nothing to do with what happened on January 6th, as mm -hmm. everybody likes to call it. Yeah. So this is about an anonymous group of people. They call themselves Anonymous Mouse. And they go about building little buildings <laughs> right. and townscapes all over Europe for street mice. Oh wow! So it sounded really cute. That is really, really it's it's that's fun. Let me show it for everybody at home. This is um, um this is a photo of um these buildings that they build for the mice. That is that is so cute. <laughs> it's actually, on BBC, and there's a two minute video that goes along with it, so people can watch it if they have the time later. Or... Yeah, yeah. Somebody um. <laughs> can post it in the chat window maybe and we can and we can watch it but um yeah that is so cool i'll and, post it after i finish speaking with you <laughs> excellent thanks so um so 
and, and it's just anonymous so, that this group does it, right? It's called Anonymous. Anonymous. <laughs> yeah. that, that's great. <laughs> So from a record store in Lund to a miniature castle on the Isle of Wight, a not a mouse say they want to remind people that the street belongs to everyone and changing that space is up to all of us. That's cute. So kind of a, a Banksy-ish type um, group too. That's interesting. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so let's... Uh, so I was like, well, my Cinderella, so it was sort of like more kid themed. So I was like, hmm, what would a kid write about this if a kid decided to write? Because I mean, it's always so serious. And since I... This was such a fun topic. I was like, let's look at it through the eyes of a kid and probably try to write as they would. I don't think I succeeded very well. But anyway, here's my take on what probably a kid, say six or seven, probably would write about it. So let's just give it a shot. So yeah, let's hear it. Building a town. If you had to build a town, what would it have? Would it have everything from an apothecary to a zoo? If you had to build a town... Who would it be for? Definitely not mice. Why not mice? Think of the mice on their poor tiny feet scampering all around, playing a game of hit and miss with our giant feet, tired out by the end of the day. Do they not deserve a place? A place to rest and relax and chat about the horrors of the day or to reminisce about that huge chunk of cheese or to ponder on a life lived free, free without cats and humans on the prowl. Do they not deserve a place? A place where the areas of life can be felt and enjoyed without chills running down the spine. Do they not deserve a place? A place where vacations can be had just a stone's throw from the cheese factory down the road, arguably the biggest tourist destination of all. Yes, yes, they do. And that is why this town was built. One of many that has everything that they need. Excellent. Thanks so much. I, I love that story and love the poem. Thanks so much, Nivedita. Excellent, as always. Thank you so much, Tim. It's always lovely talking to you. It is. Have Good a night. nice Sunday. Yep. Good night. <laughs> Good day. Okay. So um, let's see. That was Nivedita Karthik. Um, let's call up uh, Jill Spielman. See what Jill has for us today. Hello. Hey, Jill. Um, do you uh, want to share a poem? Yes. Um, uh, do you want to be on video? We can't see you yet. Um, not sure how to do that, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's a little camera button in between the hang up and the and the mute. Ah, got it. Yeah, there you go. Here you come. Nice. Great. There you I go. Think yeah. I'm like running <laughs> on a delay here or something because I. Oh yeah, so I I should warn everybody, which I I guess I forgot to do this time. There is a delay. There's like a thirty second delay. So when I call, just don't use your, you know, cl close out of your uh, video stream that you're watching on because the Skype is separate and um, thirty seconds in the future or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So um. So what was your poem that you wanted to share? Um, my poem is called Controlled Burn. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. This is my first time here, and uh. It's really delightful. I didn't know this was even existing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We've been doing this um, every every Sunday since uh, around March. You know, with the what, what happened is with the coronavirus, we started. You know, for for years we had about you know two hundred submissions maybe a week or a hundred, and we'd publish one or two. But then with the coronavirus, we were getting like a thousand a week, and so I wanted a place to share more of them. So we started doing this back then, and um, we've been doing it ever since. It's a lot of fun having an open mic every Sunday. Um, so, so what was your poem about, Controlled Burn? Um, my poem's about uh, controlled burns that we had in the Chicago area. We had extraordinary weather this fall. And then uh, with the events of January 6th, and actually the events really since the election, I finally was able to finish this poem. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hear Controlled Burn. I'll put it on screen for everybody. Uh, you have to read your own copy, though, because of that delay. Okay. So, Controlled Burn. This is old land. It's burned for millennia. Today, flame crackles gently across the hillside, controlled and behaved, a good fire. On ground was once tangled and unnavigable, the burn reveals secret holes and hidden paths, contours and gullies. No longer a nest, a singed fist of fibers lies in a scrum of scorched goldenrod. Hidden rot smolders from black Logs, smoke drifts upward in the scant breeze. 
This place down to the bare foundation now. In days, despite cold, green sprouts push through clumps of charred nubs, and juncos probe the ash. I walk gently over charred stems, over tender beginnings of regrowth, rebirth, and restoration. In the low sun, I soar with the red tail, sing with the chickadee. I want to have a controlled burn for America. I want to burn out the weeds of hate, burn out the ignorance and fear of one another, and cultivate the new supple shoots of love. Excellent. Great thanks. metaphor. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me ask, I, you know, I live up in um, on the West Coast in the mountains, like a mile up. And a control burn here is for forest fires. What's a control burn? What's the purpose of it in Chicago? Well, we um, we need to do this for the prairie and mm -hmm. for some of the trees. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, we have rainfall. We have that. We're lucky we have that. And uh, we have folks who just do a very nice, slow burning fire. And uh, it enables the uh, good plants to survive. Excellent. And yeah. Thrive. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that. I didn't realize that it was done other places because it's something that, you know, we uh, we try to get more. We, you know, we want as many control burns as possible so our, so our town doesn't burn down. So um, it, it's interesting that, you know, a different purpose for it. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one. Yeah. And that was uh, Jill Spielman once again from uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois. Um, let's see who we have next. Um, let's call up, um, let me, first I'm going to say, um, just one second. So Claire Sosa, Clara Sosa, um, sent me a message yesterday. So I'm not sure if, um, if, if Claire is here or not. Um, um. Anyway, so if if, uh, if you're here, Clara, reply to my my message just now so I can see that you're here. But let's call up uh, Paul Ruth. He says, "What's up with the Russians hacking?" Um, I'm not even sure what he's talking about. So let's find out. Hey, Paul, I can hear you. Can't quite ha. see you yet. Okay, maybe it's just been coming in. Oh, wait, it there it is. Yeah, I think you're coming now. Here you go. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So good to see you. Um, and so what do you have for us today? So I have um, what's up with the Russians hacking. Mm -hmm. um, and I obviously I, you know, I wrote this before Wednesday. Um, so I saw this news story. I've said we've been seeing it for a while. And then I saw this news story on CBS's Sunday morning. Uh, and that's where I figured hey, I think that might be fitting. Um I try to write about Wednesday, um, especially with the symbolism that the dome of the Capitol, the, the big dome um, mm -hmm. that we see today, was built during the Civil War. Um, and they continued to build that dome during the Civil War. And oh, really? as, I, didn't, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah. As they continue to talk about it being a, such a symbol of democracy, it was really they made sure they built it during the biggest test of our of our democracy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, but this poem, I thought, um, obviously the tone of it, hopefully, I, I know everyone will, will see, is sort of, I don't know if we're quite understanding or, or realizing the impacts of, you know, cyber warfare um, in a way. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and read it now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, put up, uh, what's up with the Russians hacking? Go ahead. What's up with the Russians hacking? Maybe the Russians were just trying to check on the United States' relationship status. A little stalking here and there never hurt anyone. They could have just asked or maybe write a note given to a mutual friend with two boxes asking to check yes or no. Maybe the Russians were having a cry for help, like the way a teenage dropout pushes away a hug. Maybe the Russians hacked because they were bored. You know, like sometimes when you hear a neighbor couple fighting, sometimes it spills out to the sidewalk and everyone pretends like they're, they are uninvolved while they stare. Maybe the Russians were just trying to help their friends at Amazon with their smart speakers and those ads that pop up on your social media accounts after someone has been shopping for you. Maybe they're just helping us consume better. 
Maybe the Russians were trying to unlock the mysterious calculations of credit scores, of insurance rates, of test scores, of why some get, go to better schools than others, or who is considered a threat and who isn't. Maybe the Russians just finally beat all the levels of Tetris. Probably not, though. They had that way before us. I wonder what the Russians have wondered about us. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. That was uh, What's You're Up welcome. with the Russians Hacking by, uh, um, by a Paul Ruth. Thanks so much, Paul. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, let's see. We have an incoming call. Maybe I'll just answer it. Hey, this uh, is Tim. Yes, this is uh, Victoria oh, no, you're, Garden, uh, and I. You're I live like on the to... air. <laughs> yes. You're live on the air. I just uh, uh, figured I'd answer since I was. You're calling it right I, as I uh, was, was switching over to somebody. So, uh, so you're live on the air. Who am I talking to? Victoria Garten. And um, and and what do you have to share for us today? I sent a poem called "Pretend Shaman." Okay, let me pull, let me pull it up. And what was it about? I, well, I can imagine what it was about, right? The it the horn Viking man. Uh, <laughs> one of the protesters who uh, was dressed uh, in uh, a buffalo horned head headgear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, go ahead and read it whenever you're ready. I'll put it on screen for everybody at home. Okay. Pretend shaman. January and a thirty damp degrees here and at the Capitol. I can't help wonder if he isn't cold, the bare chest of tattoos, the buffalo horn headdress warming only head and ears. When he raises the flag from bare shoulders, I see a line of young men throwing off the lessons I tried to teach, English required but unloved by the junior college masses. Was he among the huddled when we, in active shooter drill, practiced the defenses of prey? Now he crows behind the dais of Senate chamber as the elected cower in upper gallery. He could be my neighbor here in deep red country, still flying a Trump ninja warrior flag weeks after the election. I'd like to think he's merely delusional, this student neighbor minion of a delusional president, this pretend shaman of weak medicine. Excellent. Thanks Thank so much you. for sharing that. Yeah, that was Victoria Gordon with pretend shaman. Gordon, yes. Gordon yeah, for uh, yeah. with pretend shaman. Thanks so much, Victoria. Thank you. Yep. Goodbye. Okay. Yeah, that's Victoria Gordon. G A R T O N. Let's um. Let's see. Let's call up Joy Stahl. Good morning, Joy. How are you doing today? All right. Um, and what do you have for us? Well, I, I wrote about the what at the time was the most shocking uh, event, but this was before Wednesday, <laughs> uh, which was the uh, Trump phone call to the Georgia Secretary of State. Oh, I kind of forgot all about that. Um, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It yeah. seems like last week yeah, was a long really time ago. It really got overshadowed. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit. A game of telephone. Okay, so I have yeah. it on screen. Is there anything else you want to say about it, or do you want to just jump right in? Um, well... This one really morphed as I was writing it. I, first of all, the the second uh, column is all quotes from the call, and I started with that, and I went through the entire transcript of the phone call, looking for the most confusing uh, quotes, and it was my intent to to do something different with that. And then the rhyming part of the poem wrote itself and I wrote it down. And then when I went to intersperse, I discovered two things. One, I had picked exactly the right number of quotes, even though I did that first. Oh, interesting. And then <laughs> also, instead of just putting it all in a, in a row, then I decided to do it as a two voices where uh, the second column of quotes is offset. Uh, and it would work better with two people reading it, but 
we'll just have to. Well, I, I could do. I could do one part if you'd like. Well, I was worried about the delay causing a problem with that. No, I think it'd be fine. Let's just do it. Do you want to do okay. the first half? I'll do the second. Okay. Okay. A game of telephone. When I took the job I had. We appreciate the time and the call. No idea it would come to this. If we could just go over some of the numbers. A public performance review. We are quite sure that's going to happen. From the 45th POTUS. That was the tape that's been shown all over the world that makes everybody look bad. Here, over the telephone. To be honest, I am quite... We watched it certified in slow motion. Confused about it all. And then they ended up winning a lot because of the coattails. Why, he assumes that I would... They went to all sorts of methods to come up with an accurate number. Be willing to take a fall. The bottom line is when you add it all up and then you start adding, you know? Instructed on a telephone. It baffles me that he... And this may or may not be true. Refuses to accept defeat. And many of those numbers are certified, or they will be certified, but they are certified. Why does it take such a long call? But I mean, there were other things that were almost as bad as that. Just release it in a tweet. And even if you cut them in half, cut them in half and cut them in half again. Instead of on the telephone. Oh, wait, he did use Twitter. It's just, you know, but it was, it was something that it can't be disputed. That bird has long since flown. It's more illegal for you than it is for them. Yet he persists and cajoles. If it was a mistake, I don't know. With claims so overblown. That's before we go to the next step, which is in the process of right now. How much longer on my telephone? Now the time has come for us. And, and you didn't know that, but you know it. But now you know it. To release the tape to the world. Because those numbers are so wrong. To confirm that it is not. But we got that information from you. Only my head that's world. That's the real truth. By this game of telephone. Excellent. Thanks so much, Joe. That was a lot of fun. And those are some interesting quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for helping me read it. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay, it was Joy Stahl. And um, let's see. We have... Uh, Susan Talley left, um, and then I'm going to read a poem by a hyben from Carlton Johnson. Let me um, put this up here. Now, Carlton says, um, today's a hyben that I had written a while back, not exactly about the, the chaos in D.C., but since you said I and others could send any poem, so I sent this one. Um, I think it's, I know, I think for a poet to respond, it should relate to the news, but I think it does, you know, if it has to do with some chaos, I think um, there's a lot of chaos going on in the world. So let's, uh, let's uh, read this high, high bin for uh, Carlton Johnson. Here we go. I'll, sh I'll put it on screen. Got to get rid of that too. Okay. Um, Today I make a plaintive journey into the underbrush of silence. Uh, was there a title? I just want to make sure I didn't miss the title. Okay, I don't think there was. Um, so today I make a plaintive journey into the underbrush of silence. Today I make an observation as to what silence means, what it invokes. There is a swelter of lost words dying on the vine waiting to be heard. What? I can't hear you. I want to hear you from the soft, cold recesses in the intermingling of guttural and explosive fricatives. There is a little... There is a little in this place where beatitude meets quietude. Here, I listen to Miss Ella belting out tunes, cry me a river, and in the momentary pause, an instant, I can see what is fashioned in the breadth of air. Between each beat, each measure, there is a moment when voice meets the silken fabric of air and sets sail. This river of voices, it's breathing along the dark shores. Silence echoes us. That was a high one by Carlton Johnson. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. Always a pleasure to read uh, your poems. 
And, um, and I think that relates to, to current events. So I think that's appropriate for today. Thanks so much for sharing it. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I get to everybody. Um, let's see. There's a message from Dan Brady um, about um, different time zones and stuff and, and mentions that he can't make it for uh, the Poetry Spun Live because of the time where, where he is. Um, so would rather read on Tuesday. And that's something you can do, too. I should I should mention, you know, the, the open mic here is supposed to be just about current events, you know, poems based on what's going on right now. Um, but the open mic on Tuesday night can be anything um, after our guest. And so if you'd like to share, uh, if you can't make it live, like if you're watching this after the fact and saying, I wish I could be here, but it's 3 a.m. where I am, um, you can always join at, uh, on Tuesday for, po- for um, the Rattlecast. And, and I, I do the, all the things we do. We do three videos a week. And I intentionally do them at different times so that people who have different schedules can at least get catch one of them, you know, so um, catch one of them live so you can participate. So um, so the and it's just sort of my day stretched out as much as possible. So we have uh, this is at 9 a.m. for me, uh, noon Eastern. And then um, the Rattlecast is at, is at uh, 6 p.m. for me and uh, 9 Eastern, 9 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, the critique of the week is 2 p.m. for me and 5 p.m. Eastern uh U- u.s times so um so they're spread out so that you can make something and uh if you can't make poetry spun live feel free to share your poem though on um the rattlecast tuesday night uh let me see uh let me see who else we have i want to make sure i don't miss anybody so clara sosa i don't think is here right now so maybe clara sosa can uh, call on tuesday like i was saying let's do susan tally Hey Susan, how you doing? Oh, I hear myself I'm in the good. background. I hear myself in the background. So can you cut that off? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna mute you until you do. So I still hear it. Just close out of whatever wherever you're listening to the broadcast on. There we go. Okay. Now let me let me pull you okay. in for everybody else. Um, yeah. So how are you doing today? I'm good. I didn't know you would really call me today, so I'm just kind of scrambling. <laughs> no, no, no problem at all. It's uh, I don't know. I wish we had some kind of a, a better system with like a, I don't know, some kind of call hold or maybe that would work better. But, um, but it is what it is. It, it works, I think. Um, so you have um a poem about um Kamala Harris, right? Yes. And and is there anything was, you want to? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was um, during the debate when I watched it, her vice presidential debate. Okay, well, let's go ahead and hear it. I'll, I'll, um, I'll put it on screen for everybody. Go ahead and read it when Thank I read it. Thank you. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. About Pamela Harris, no one could look more respectful or patient standing in a noisy airplane hangar waiting for Joe Biden to break away from reporters. Kamala... Kamala never, Kamala never loses sight of her running mate. I watched her on stage when the crooked-necked Pence twisted in his belittled message. I remembered the way a woman, sometimes the children gathered, takes a needed pause, her hand resting on her necklace, the moment of contemplation before turning a page of a sinister fairy tale the way she finds the words of revision. Excellent. Thanks so much. That was Susan Talley with About Pamela Harris. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Susan. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Well, we're getting up on the hour. Um, let's do one more caller. And um, let's, do, uh, let's do Joseph Nolan. Let me pull up uh, Joseph's poem as we go. Hey, Joseph, how are you doing today? Hello, Tim. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Hello, Tim. Can you I hear me? I don't think you can hear me, but I can hear you. I think we're using the wrong camera, too. I think you're. Okay, I had my speakers okay. off. Let me just uh, turn them off so I can yeah, no echo. Problem. Okay, well, actually, I suppose I have to listen somewhere. Uh, so, yeah, I have one poem uh, Buffalo Man of the Capitol. You know, the weird thing is, I'm. So this relates yeah, to. Yeah, I can tell that you. I feel like. What did you read last week? Didn't you read something last week? Oh, I'm having some. Well, why don't you just go ahead and read it then? I'm getting a feedback from this. Yeah. Well, why don't you just mute yourself and and read this, and then I'll put it on screen. Maybe we need to okay. have you call me back. Okay. Well, I'll call him back in one second. Um, yeah, but the thing is, I'm having a weird deja vu experience right now. Didn't wasn't there something very similar that uh, Joseph read a week or two ago? Was he like being psychic? I don't know. Um, but we'll call. Give it a moment to to get set up and maybe we can uh, we can do this let's call joseph back hey joseph are you better now yes yeah, so uh i think i'll be okay i think uh the echoes okay good good um what was it last week are you there are you there well, why don't you just go ahead and read it, Joseph? Um, I think we are having some audio problems, but if you can hear hear me, just go ahead and read it because we can hear you fine. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Buffalo yeah. Man of the Capitol Building. Who was Buffalo? Shirtless under animal skin. Wearing a huge amulet under his buffalo horns. Oh, buffalo man, I nominate thee to be our shaman of the Senate. To cast chicken bones upon the Senate floor. To summon the oracle, the blind goddess of justice. To loudly pronounce, I see no evil, no evil here. Carry on, move along, there is nothing. Here, folks, I expect to talk about the strange state of life, but they didn't. No he must have been too tall to know. I have learned that when or if work collapses, do not expect others to call to discuss it, since they will be absorbed in some great gravitational implosion. That sucks the breath out of conversation. Still, there's time to make a run. The pretzels in here, leaving the TV behind for a brief intermission, and wait for the next monumental demolition resulting from duty's dereliction in our strange game of the mind in the poem. Excellent. Thanks so much. It was Joseph Nolan reading uh, his poem for this week, which was um, a Buffalo Man of the Capitol Building. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joseph. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Yeah, so um, I don't know. Does anybody else... What am I thinking of? It feels like there was a chicken bones and a shaman last week. Or am I just like, have I lost it? I don't know. <laughs> that, that seemed very familiar. I'm mean, very deja vu -y. Um Okay, well, we, are, we are out of time. Um, let's just do our uh Saiku of the week now today's Saiku is based on this article here this was um research put over here for everyone to see what we we hear what we expect to hear this is research out of um the Technical University of Dresden and um the researchers basically hooked people up to an mRNA, mRNA machine and um they they shown patterns um of sound and then, here we go. And then uh, watch for stimulation in the uh, in, in the uh, auditory pathways. And the interesting thing um, is that they found that we only hear. So so we we project out what we expect to hear, and we only hear the things that um, that deviate from that expectation. So that's a strange thing. We hear what we expect to hear, and it's to save um, neural resources. So there's only so much uh, room, is a theory anyway. We don't really know for sure what's going on. But um, there's only so much room 
in our neurons to transport sense signals. And so what we do to cope for that is we project a hypothesis of what is expected um, onto the world. And then we only process the data that deviates from that expectation. So everything that we see and seem and sense and, and all of our senses is, is mostly our imagination being projected outward and then adjusting where that hypothesis of what the world is like fails. And um, it raises some really strange questions. And um, I don't even understand at an information processing level. I don't understand how, um, how they could be filtered. You know, because what, what's being projected in the brain would have to be processed on that auditory pathway. I don't know. It's a strange, a strange thing and to imagine um, how much, though, that your ex expectations are influencing your perception of reality. Because it doesn't appear that way to us, but that is the way the brain works. And I couldn't, I couldn't decide what, I don't know, I had three haiku that I was playing with, and I couldn't decide which one I liked. So um, I'm, I'll just read all three they're they're sh pretty short um so you can maybe you can tell me which one you like best but here are my three saiku for this week based on that uh, science story sensing what we want to see reality sensing what we want to see reality that's saiku number one the sky is blue too i guess the sky is blue too i guess is one line haiku number two. And then uh, here's the third. Waiting on the local weather report, clouds tomorrow. Waiting on the local weather report, clouds tomorrow. And those are my saiku today based on that story from, um, from Dresden Technical University. Um, and that is the show for today. Thanks, everybody, for participating. As always, it's always a pleasure. Um, let me pull up uh, the prompt just to remind everybody. Um, the prompt for the Rattlecast this Tuesday was of course oh yeah a circus with no audience so um write your poem a circus with no audience and um the guest uh, this week is going to be alexis rotella and um alexis of course is a former president of the haiku society of america um, she's author of over 40 books mostly in japanese forms and uh, her newest book is Dancing the Tarantella, a Tonka sequence. She um, is a finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize this year with um, her book of, um, or for, I guess it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's Hyben that, that, uh, that she's a finalist for, a Hyben in the current issue of Rattle. And uh, everybody can feel free to vote on that up until uh, February 1st if you're a subscriber. And uh, we'll talk to her about Dancing the Tarantella in, in short forms, and it should be a lot of fun. Um, and I, I should remind everybody, too, if this pops up right, that the Rattle Shepard Prize deadline is Friday, January 15th. So uh, you have a few days left to put 20 or, or maybe 15 poems together, uh, make a little chat book, and submit it. It's a way to extend your subscription. If you're a print subscriber, the entry fee is 25 bucks, but you get a, a one-year subscription. And three poets win and have uh, $5,000 each in distribution to all of our really almost 9,000 subscribers now. And um, it's, a, it's a big prize for a little book. And uh, so don't miss out on that. But uh, in the meantime, I will see you on Tuesday night for Alexis Rotella, Rattlecast number 75, Tuesday, January 12th, 9 p.m. Eastern. Hope you have a good rest of your Sunday, and I will see you then. Bye.